So I'm gonna I'm gonna mute myself both video and audio so that I can kind of work in the background as we get started here. So um, Bob Solger is a um, a long time solar expert. Um, the uh, energy what well, what was the name of your shop that you had, Bob? Your store. The energy saving store. The energy saving. I was going to say that, and I thought that can't be right. But that that's that's where I first knew Bob, and uh, so now he's got his solar design studio, and he does consulting locally, internationally, uh, and interplanetarily uh, about solar energy, and so he is one of our informational gems. He has started. Uh, he has built his new home, which is uh, a few inches away from being totally energy independent. He will be telling us about all that stuff. So Bob, if there's anything, anything you wanna to add to your introduction, please do so. And I'm going to mute my video and then my audio and I'll... Okay, well, Craig, you can hear me loud and clear? Yes. Okay, well, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Well, uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our Everything Solar tour of our home. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, chat with you folks today. Of course, Craig uh, mentioned in brief introduction, uh, I am Bob Solger. Been in the solar business for a long time. Uh, so uh, what I'd uh, like to uh, do is take a little time and explain a few things to you. But first off, today is the uh, summer solstice, so happy summer solstice 2020. And just kind of a, a few fun facts. Uh, sol summer solstice is unique uh, astronomical event that occurs. It, it is the longest day of the year, as we all know. But there is an uh, what they refer to as an annulunar eclipse of the sun, uh, which is, uh, from what I understand, not too unusual. Uh, but the, the position of the eclipse relative to the glacier of the equator will be seen uh, for those uh, that are, are looking for it. And that's what uh, here in the upper left-hand corner reflects. But things to do today, if you're so inclined on uh, summer solstice, uh, if you feel like it, cast a spell on somebody. Uh, we've all risen early, I'm sure. Uh, make some solar elixir, express gratitude uh, to everyone around you and check in with yourself, of course. Host a gathering, but beware of social uh, distancing. And we are hosting a gathering uh, today of sorts, even though it's virtual. Uh, and unleash your spirit, uh, just like these folks are. Of course, uh, Stonehenge is uh, famous uh, gatherings on uh, summer solstice. So there's a little link on Facebook if you're so inclined. Uh, some folks in Sweden celebrating the solstice and in Portugal. So, but again, happy summer solstice uh, today. So, but uh, what um, we're moving into now is uh, really the tour. And uh, we're really uh, couching this or presenting this as a tour uh, for you uh, in that um, we wanted to uh, give you a, a feel for what we've done out here in our quest uh, to ultimately live off grid and be self-sufficient from an energy perspective uh, and um, provide some um, uh, context behind it. So our tour, what we're going to provide you with is uh, an overview and an introduction to our home as it's uh, finished and going back and talking about some things back in the day. But the, there's a concept uh, that uh, through our business, the solar design studio, because the focus of our business has become uh, uh, really over the last 10 years, we do quite a bit of engineering consulting, uh, uh, not only here locally, but uh, really throughout the country. And we've done work overseas. Uh, and our, our clients are really about uh, leveraging uh, sustainability and uh, the concept of uh, using solar is key to that. Uh, these days, we're 
uh, actively involved with multifamily housing, both in the low and moderate income uh, spaces in the high end spaces with our client base. Uh, uh, so some uh, uh, large projects, which uh, in the end will be making a significant impact on uh, mitigating issues related to climate change. But so we're going to talk about the concept of uh, everything solar and how we applied it to our home. And we're going to touch upon how you can apply the concept to your home. And then uh, through the process, we've learned a lot and we continue to learn a lot. Um, and in turn, um, I'd like to give you an update of uh, the solar and storage market as well as far as trends uh, in the industry. Uh, and of course, uh, I'd like to also share with you uh, issues uh, related to policy. Uh, both uh, locally and at the federal level, and a quick little wrap up. So, so with that, uh, we'll move right along. So, to start out with, the, the concept of everything solar it really involves the proper application of products uh, and technologies. Uh, there's a lot of stuff on the market uh, today uh, when we talk about solar. Uh, solar and battery storage are uh, becoming more and more synonymous. Actually, they're one and the same uh, in terms of what uh, clients are asking for. But uh, you also have other components that figure into the uh, grand scheme of things. Electric vehicles are, are key and very, very important. Uh, you have uh, smart uh, devices in the home, a uh, term called the Internet of Things that we hear a lot about. Um, so uh, in turn, a lot of that ca can be overwhelming um, for folks. Um, and so how do you actually uh, make informed decisions uh, about what you're going to spend uh, your money on to achieve what you want to in the end? So it's really the concept um, focuses on uh, really understanding what uh, the appropriate products or, and or technology makes sense for your situation uh, from a, a, a consumer perspective. Solar PV and battery storage to use energy, solar energy in particular more efficiently to power your home or building. And these concepts apply not only to homeowners, but also if you're a business owner involved with businesses, uh, large and small. So, um, so that's where the focus of the concept is, is everything solar that we embrace. So in turn, our goal was, is to live off grid essentially, um, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, the home we built, uh, is a passive uh, solar home. It's a, a small home, a little more than 1,300 square feet. Um, we, in, in working with Shauna, uh, who we've known for years, and Shauna Zaner is uh, probably one of the best uh, resources uh, in the area um, on uh, energy efficient and passive homes. She lives in one herself, and uh, she's worked for uh, a builder for many years, uh, who's uh, Stitt Homes out of Arkansas. Uh, she learned a lot from uh, Orlo Stitt, the master, as they call him. And I still run into Orlo occasionally at industry uh, events, uh, but uh, he's well known in, in the energy efficiency space and particularly with passive solar homes. So over the years, we learned a lot. We've had relationship with people like Shauna, and when it got time for us to um, do what we wanted to do, we reached out to her. But the home is small, and uh, when we talk about a passive solar home, what we um, uh, encapsulated in it, we built it, uh, had it built with uh, SIP panels or SIP construction. It's uh, structured insulated panels. Those most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with it. But a SIP panel looks like an Oreo cookie with uh, OSB board on each side, and the cream is really that foam on the inside. And they're specifically made for uh, your uh, design, uh, so it's not something you buy off the shelf. You have to have uh, them made uh, for uh, your uh, particular design. Uh, we have. Uh, 
to heat the home, aside from the sun, uh, we installed uh, radiant uh, uh, floors in the home, uh, which are um, heated uh, with a propane boiler, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Another uh, aspect of what we've used um, to, to heat and cool the home is uh, mini splits. Um, and uh, off to the right hand side here where my little cursor is, this is a mini split and this is a, uh, a the outdoor uh, portion of the unit, uh, the compressor uh, for uh, and heat pump. Uh, in turn, uh, this is for heating and cooling and this is the head that goes in respective living places uh, here. Uh, and in the case of the home, uh, the orientation of the home is to the south at 165 degrees. It's not true south at uh, 180, uh, but uh, in turn, uh, close enough for uh, what we need uh, uh, to accomplish uh, what we wanted to do with uh, passive heating during the winter months. Um, in turn, our, our business, um, uh, we run our business, a solar design studio, uh, property in, uh, in a separate building. The property had a uh, 2,000 foot uh, square, square foot barn, a pole barn, uh, that uh, we repurposed it uh, into a combination garage, office space, and conference uh, space. Uh, and in turn, um, as part of our process uh, in insulating this uh, building, we reached out to um, an insulating expert uh, here in Kansas City, uh, Michael Connell, who I've known for years. Um, and Mike offered, uh, as he always does, his opinion and some suggestions on how to uh, effectively insulate a pole barn that's being repurposed with walls and uh, putting in uh, two by six walls. And we ended up uh, putting foam board in and blowing cellulose uh, in and really tightened it up um, in terms of uh, what we were able to do and working with what we had here. So that, that was uh, really helpful. So we heat and cool the um, uh, barn uh, or the office space and conference space uh, with mini splits as well. But um, one of the inhibitors uh, to our efforts to get off grid is really effectively running uh, the heat pumps to heat during the winter, particularly uh, out uh, in the uh, barn area. Because um, that's key. Uh, we've uh, been learning as uh, we've been going, and uh, I'll talk more about uh, the mini splits. Mini splits are wonderful uh, devices, and they're uh, becoming more and more mainstream. They're, um, they're relatively inexpensive in the grand scheme of things and they're uh, units uh, that can run multiple heads here. In this case, this uh, unit here runs two heads. One in the house actually runs three heads often. No duct work required. Uh, it's uh, very uh, efficient for air conditioning purposes uh, and heating uh, in term in the winter months. Uh, so, uh, and the key, the trick is, and what we've learned uh, based on our experiences, is getting the sizing of these systems right for your particular space uh, and uh, being able to uh, particularly heat the space. Uh, uh, properly with a heat pump. Heat pumps are great, great things uh, to, to have, and that is the future uh, with respect to um, uh, heating and cooling homes. And uh, it, it, as uh, the trend uh, really for homes, if you're, if say you're building a home or even retrofitting your home, if you can become an all electric home uh, and ultimately get into adding solar to it, that's the best way to go. Uh, reason being, if you have, if you heat with natural gas and uh, you have electric, you have water, if you notice your bills, you have customer charges for each of those. So, and those customer charges um, cover the initial cost 
of just having like a gas meter in the service to your property. That's a fixed cost that the utility charges you. You can eliminate that um, if, you're tra if you have an existing home and go all electric by putting in um, either uh, a heat pump uh, system, all electric, uh, for example. I've worked with people that have done that over the years and they're very, very happy with centralized uh, heat pump uh, units and uh, air conditioning, it's all electric. So, so can be done. So, so that's a, again, to summarize our home uh, and a business, the home is a passive solar home. The, the business is an old barn that uh, we uh, embrace some energy efficiency uh, concepts. So moving right along, uh, the process uh, as far from an everything solar perspective, there is a process um, in terms of, and if you're, if you're looking at solar and working with a number of the companies around town, um, one of the first steps uh, they will always ask you for is your um, last 12 or 24 months of electric usage. That starts out with an analysis of the historic usage of, of the system. And from, that, and from that historic energy usage, the kilowatt hours, not what you're paying, but the kilowatt hours, you're gonna properly size the system uh, to offset uh, all of uh, your usage or percentage of your usage. Of course, the space you have to install a solar array is limited uh, by your physical roof size, for example. If you're doing a ground mount system, not, not a problem. Uh, exception being uh, in Kansas, uh, uh, by uh, tariffs uh, with Evergy, uh, you're limited in size residentially to 15 kW type of systems. Um, in terms of uh, what Evergy allows you to size a system for in uh, Missouri, uh, as well as based on your historical usage. So a size of system, uh, allows you to properly de design a solar PV system and if you're going to use uh, battery storage. And then uh, systems insulation is, is key. Proper uh, sy system insulation um, in terms of uh, using quality uh, products, both uh, modules and inverters, and I'll talk more about the inverters being the most important component. But uh, in terms of uh, understanding then how you're using energy it, uh, in terms of smart energy usage um, is uh, through consumption monitoring uh, based on uh, the, the monitoring system uh, that uh, generally uh, comes with uh, solar PV systems. And we'll, we'll look at an example of what we do at our home and how that uh, would be applied. So consumption monitoring is key and consumption monitoring really refers to how much you are actually using and when you're using it. So, so, and being smart about it. So smart homes with the trend uh, now have the uh, ability through solar technology to actually um, begin managing uh, how uh, appliances uh, utilize energy during the course of a day uh, or in, and or in the evening. So uh, as I mentioned from the onset, uh, solar and uh, battery storage are synonymous. So uh, in the traditional way of thinking about energy storage of batteries, and I need backup power uh, in the event of a power outage. Well, that's uh, been uh, the thinking for years until the last few years well, with the trend towards uh, self-consumption. And what I mean by self-consumption uh, during the day, uh, you're going to produce um, a lot of power with solar, your solar array. You're either going to use it or it goes on a grid and you're going to net meter it or get net metering credits. And then use those credits um, to uh, uh, offset what you're pulling from the utility during a billing period. That's basically what net metering is all about. But if you have battery storage and you enable self-consumption, um, you can uh, uh, keep your batteries charged with solar and then uh, pull energy at night off of your batteries and not so much worry about uh, the net metering aspects uh, of um, how uh, 
that energy may be applied for your credits if you have extra credits and uh, how that may affect things in the grand scheme of things. So um, that's what self-consumption is all about. In the event of a power outage, of course, uh, the batteries will support uh, the loads in your home that you've designated for backup power. Uh, so uh, solar and electric vehicles, um, uh, electric vehicles are becoming more of a key component of any solar PV system um, that um, be, uh, put in whether the client has an EV or not or they're planning on uh, an electric vehicle. Um, so uh, uh, in terms of inverters as they evolve, uh, we get into uh, talking again about smart energy usage. How much of my solar can I divert to charging my electric vehicle, for example, if, a, if it's parked at home uh, uh, during daylight hours, if you work from home, for example. Uh, like many of us do. And then in the end, uh, the return on investment analysis is understanding uh, how um, not only the system is going to perform in terms of what it's producing for you with energy, but uh, how it's actually saving uh, you uh, money and understanding it. There's a couple of things to keep in mind um, as far as investments you do make in, in uh, your property. Uh, energy efficiency and solar can add value to your home and more and more market data and the thinking is changing in, uh, in the real estate world, at least what I've been exposed to as to the value of what um, a, a home with these improvements uh, can uh, make compared to one without the improvements. And there was uh, a study um, uh, in Zillow uh, I want to say it was early this year or late uh, last year. Some of you may have seen it, but uh, they studied all the states. And as I recall, in the case of uh, Zillow rated Missouri, Kansas, uh, a home uh, with uh, features, uh, energy efficiency, solar, uh, it increased the value uh, by a little bit more than four and a half percent compared to uh, uh, comparable without. So that's something you should uh, keep in mind uh, when you're uh, looking at making investments in energy efficiency and of course uh, solar, what it can do. So uh, the key Bob, is, uh, uh, go ahead, Shauna. I just might add on that last part on your last screen, the one step that people might add if they have an existing home as opposed to if they're building a new home like you did. When you were building your new home, you were, to build, you were able to build all the energy efficiency things into it. If people are starting with their current home, they might want to consider to have an energy audit somewhere in there and tighten up their home or add Absolutely. insulation or do, do things to tighten up their home and make it more energy efficient before then they do their calculations about what a side solar system they need. That, that's just, true because uh, yep. if you can, yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. And uh, audits are, are key. And there are some good auditors still around town. Okay. So how we apply the concept in terms of understanding usage load and sizing, so and sizing battery storage is what we're going to visit with next. Um, because we're building a new home, uh, and when I, when I work with clients, um, there, there's a tool um, that we use in our business called Building Energy Optimization. And briefly, what it does is you can model um, the, the uh, structure um, based on square footage, bedrooms, and then there's a whole attribute list of characteristics of the home uh, that you can click on, like, uh, how you're constructing with SIP panels or ICF or conventional construction, stick construction, type of insulation, uh, mechanicals like mini splits, high efficient heat pumps or ground source uh, heat pumps, uh, appliances that you're going to use and solar and what um, and uh, types of windows, for example, and you, you can do a trade-off analysis in this uh, program and what it produces in the end, it estimates your kilowatt hour usage and where it's going to allocate uh, uh, to uh, things in your uh, home. Uh, so in our case, uh, modeled uh, our home 
home uh, and we were projecting just the home part of a little bit more than 5,000 kilowatt hours that the home would uh, use uh, based on assumptions. And uh, there are uh, architects, uh, some use a tool, similar tool to this, uh, it, but it's, uh, it's really powerful in terms of getting the numbers uh, to make some informed decisions. Uh, yeah, and, uh, a trade-off uh, can be uh, whether you use uh, uh, a, a particular type of window, for example, or uh, you're considering a type of uh, cooling option, uh, mini splits versus central, and you look at the cost uh, associated with installing mini splits uh, versus centralized or ground source heat pump. Uh, uh, that can all be done in these environments and uh, these software environments. It's not that difficult to do. Uh, so, uh, so, Again, in new construction, you're going to estimate uh, energy usage. In an existing home, uh, reviewing the utility bills is really key, and this is our home. Uh, but um, in, in our case, uh, the green uh, bar chart was uh, uh, before we uh, brought the solar uh, on board, and, and the uh, blue is with the solar. But in this area, in the heating months, this is where we run into the issue with the uh, heat pumps. Uh, so, uh, but uh, we've uh, taken steps to uh, better understand now these heat pumps, uh, how they behave so we can size the uh, battery uh, uh, size of things. So in our first year between the uh, house and the office the business, we used about 6,200 uh, kilowatt hours. Uh, so our model, we were allocated uh, about a thousand, a little more than actually closer to twelve hundred to the uh, uh, business because uh, it's on the same meter. Uh, so, uh, and I'll show you how we did that. Uh, but uh, this is for, for the again to summarize for the existing homeowner looking at your actual usage uh, from your electric bills. This can be downloaded from Evergy's website. Uh, they've got some great uh, tools to assist you in, in that area. But for existing uh, home uh, owners, uh, something if you want to get started and you want to be informed, uh, there's something called making a device called Sense. Uh, so I like to refer to this as making sense of your usage with Sense. It's actually a product and it's sense.com if you're so inclined. There are other products on the market as well uh, from uh, the energy detective is one, another one. But th this device as well as others, uh, Sense in particular, um, it's easy to install and it wires into your uh, main service panel and uh, it, it uh, uh, actually measures the load and learns the load profile of your home and pumps it up to a cloud and it, it uses artificial intelligence to understand uh, each of the, the devices that are running in your home when they uh, run and you can make predictions uh, based on um, the appliances you use what it's going to cost you to uh, uh, run those appliances uh, uh, on an annual basis and everybody drinks coffee so it costs about four bucks a year at least in our home to run a coffee maker based on uh, the usage it's uh, what we've seen uh, since we um, installed a uh, sense to collect uh, uh, hard data on specific uh, uh, items uh, in our home and this is what we're using to uh, better understand how uh, these uh, heat pumps uh, are forming part of the mini splits. Uh, so, so this has been very, very helpful. So uh, if you're so inclined, uh, uh, this is a device to start out with uh, and it's not terribly expensive as well. Uh, so and it's easy to install. You can, if you're so inclined uh, a little bit uh, as a do-it-yourself or uh, it can be installed in your circuit breaker panel or you can get an elect electrician, but then it plugs into the, the internet via your Wi-Fi and goes up to a cloud. So, so Sense is again, one tool to understand uh, actual uh, usage uh, and consumption in a home. In the case of our, uh, what came out of our um, 
analysis of uh, how we uh, size our solar PV system. And um, uh, what we have is an 8.54 kW uh, system that's comprised of 28 305 watt um, solar modules, um, a 7.6 kW uh, AC inverter, and we added, uh, um, we had the solar in first and then added the batteries afterwards. Uh, we have 20 kilowatt hours of battery storage. And uh, what I wanted to refer to is this is a snippet of the monitoring system uh, on our uh, home uh, through uh, the, the company uh, product called Solar Edge. And uh, what I'm going to do is actually go to uh, my browser here and actually look at things in real time um, to, to give you folks a, a feel for what we're talking about here, a better field than a static display. Uh, this is the array, and even though it's a little cloudy out there, uh, we're still cranking out or putting out uh, over 5 kW of solar. Our batteries are almost uh, completely charged, uh, so the, the, the property is not consuming much uh, power at this point in time. Just to give you uh, an idea, our um, demand, uh, uh, as I scroll down here, our self-consumption at this point in time, and what we're running is uh, some uh, air conditioning uh, from one of the mini splits, a uh, fan, uh, and uh, the air conditioning in the home, and computers. So we're barely using uh, less than half a kW, 0.429 kW of um, power at this point in time. But our production um, is, uh, right at this instance, is uh, 4.6 kW. So our consumption, uh, we're consuming uh, just a portion of what we're producing. And uh, we're exporting um, uh, quite a bit of power, but at the same time, uh, we're getting our batteries charged from running overnight here. Our battery uh, energy level is 82.6%. Uh, and which, how much of the uh, solar is going to the batteries is reflected here. And this is all in real time. Uh, so uh, you can see uh, by the chart, when I'll try and uh, get, get uh, the, how the profile for the day has gone based on the time. Uh, so. We have uh, here uh, a view in real time of what um, our home is, uh, what we're producing and what we're using and then what we're exporting uh, to the utility. So, uh, and if I, if I would go back uh, to say, uh, see, yesterday wasn't a great day, but uh, Thursday was a nice sunny day and see if that comes back up. This gives you a real good idea of, uh, again, usage in the home where the uh, lighter green is the solar production, is the big curve here. Uh, the self-consumption is this uh, lighter blue uh, here in terms of what we're using. And then overall consumption, which would combines uh, both what we draw from off the solar and in some cases off the grid. And the consumption for that day was uh, just a little more than a, a half a kilowatt hour. Uh, but we self-consumed from what we uh, produced uh, was almost 22 kilowatt hours. And we exported uh, a little bit more than 33 kilowatt hours. So um, this is what's, um, transpiring in real time with these systems with batteries and you're again keeping uh, you, your batteries in, in a full state of charge uh, at all times until you need to draw off them and uh, in a case like today it is clouding up a little bit we may the system may uh, draw off the batteries like it's doing now uh, to supplement what what we're needing to use so it shifts around uh, in real time. And the inverter is managing all that. And we're gonna take a look at our inverter here in, in a few minutes. Uh, so, so what we have then in summary is a real time view 
uh, with respect to how we're using our uh, energy uh, through the monitoring. And these, this monitoring is um, uh, really uh, gives a uh, not only a real time but a smart view of what's transpiring and how your solar is uh, main uh, maintaining uh, or how you would maintain your solar because we can uh, drill down into how the system is performing uh, and uh, where problems might be occurring. So, and most the uh, solar manufacturers have fairly robust uh, monitoring systems. Uh, Solar Edge being one which we use, of course. Uh, Enphase, the microinverter manufacturers, uh, there's a number of uh, residential installs around this area that use Enphase, uh, for example. Uh, those two companies have some of the best monitoring uh, systems on the market and, and uh, can do what uh, uh, I'm showing here uh, and reflect that. And uh, even folks with the Tesla. Power wall can get a view of um, what's transpiring um, from uh, those power walls that are part of the system. And you can look at other inverter manufacturers as well, like SMA and Fronius and their monitoring systems. So let's take a look at a few things uh, here. Uh, we'll take a look at the solar array real briefly and uh, our battery room and go from there. So we uh, recorded a couple of videos here just to give you a sense of what's going on. Windy day here. Uh, th this uh, is the 28 panels, two rows of 14 uh, that's uh, roof mounted, of course, and the orientation on the barn is uh, 150 degrees uh, to the south. It's not due south uh, here. Uh, so, and uh, point on not only the mini split, but the uh, cooling lines or the copper lines that run to the heads uh, here, you see. So from the solar array, uh, we wire into our, uh, um, what we call the battery room. And here the inverter, you uh, can see the inverter is running the display. And we'll take a look at the batteries here. And we have th these batteries are uh, from, um, are manufactured by LG, Life's Good. Uh, LG Chem is the product uh, line. Uh, and when we purchase these, the capacity of each of these batteries is approximately 10 kilowatt hours. And you can, the most you can add to this inverter is two. Uh, so we have a little transfer switch um, that allows us to run everything off grid. And we have run off grid the whole house. And how we're tied into the rest of the house is we're back feeding a breaker through uh, this panel to our main panel, um, which we'll uh, take a peek at in a moment. But this uh, is a typical way with which to uh, install solar and uh, uh, tie it into a, a, a main service panel in, in your home. So, and when, how we did that, the next uh, video we'll take a peek at. This is in our um, uh, little basement that we have. <clears throat> and uh, the, the solar comes in here. And over here is a consumption meter uh, in this little box that's wired into the panel here. And we have a sense unit in this panel, as well as the panel here out in the uh, bar. Uh, but, this little device is communicating through that little blue wire uh, back to the inverter. And at night, this little device is telling the inverter to draw off the batteries. Here we're zeroing in on the uh, breakers that we have here and everything. So, uh, so th this is again, uh, how we set up the uh, point of uh, interconnection uh, with the home for the solar. So uh, again, uh, with respect to uh, deploying a solar, uh, we sized it for the home. We've actually oversized it uh, from a net metering perspective. And we did that on purpose to accommodate batteries down the road. And uh, systems can be uh, expanded or planned to be expanded. And that's something uh, that you um, can uh, plan for. And we're currently working with a couple of clients that uh, 
are wishing to do that. Now the home itself, um, and this is key because this is where the main load is, um, the passive uh, features, of course, are the directions uh, that we uh, orientated the house to, it's 165 degrees. Um, the windows, uh, the uh, here, the southern exposure and the eaves, um, this was designed to uh, keep the sun out during the summer months and uh, let the sun in during the uh, uh, winter months uh, through the windows uh, and uh, heat the uh, living space. So, and this approach uh, by the orientation and uh, the glazing or the number of windows you put in, uh, our little uh, propane uh, radiant floor uh, system does not run too terribly much. In fact, we've got a 250-gallon propane tank uh, buried uh, here under this little garden. And uh, we, if we, uh, in two years now that we've used it, because uh, we uh, cook with propane uh, as well and run a tankless hot water heater, uh, we maybe use two thirds of the tank if that. Uh, the home is built with structured insulated panels, uh, SIPs that we talked about earlier, and the uh, home to attic, uh, really tight uh, uh, insulation. So again, the key is the orientation of the home and um, the ability to leverage the solar resource. For those of you that always wondered what a radiant floor, what you're going to do in the case of our home, we tried to build the home just great on slab, uh, or slab on grade, excuse me. Uh, but uh, because of the topography we had to deal with, we have a little basement. Uh, but um, this is uh, how the floor was looking before it went in. You see the tubing. There's actually a total of five zones uh, here. Uh, the rebar to... Uh, that the uh, tubes are tied to. Uh, so uh, each loop is put together. So uh, you clearly see uh, the effort put forth here. And you have uh, uh, the exterior, of the um, concrete uh, that makes up uh, the foundation. Uh, this is insulated. And this is a little more than uh, four feet deep. Um, and it's all filled with rock. So you've got a thermal mass in there. Uh, as well, so um, real, real important to get that right. Uh, so, uh, in turn, um, the end product, and uh, we'll take a look at uh, things here in the, in the home. Um, concrete floors, uh, really no carpet for us because we don't like carpet. We even have a, a fireplace; it's a propane fireplace, so we've got extra heating capacity, but. Um, as you can see uh, from the standpoint of this being summer months now, uh, the, when we took this uh, video, uh, it, this was around lunchtime and the sun's way up there, but nothing's coming in. So again, that's key in a passive feature. Uh, with respect to appliances, Energy Star, um, refrigerator, important, doesn't use much uh, energy over the course of a year. Our little boiler, um, we worked actually with another uh, a, a company here um, to size this boiler for um, the floor and we had an engineer involved. It's a tankless boiler uh, that uh, we had installed, uh, of course, and it has uh, five zones and uh, a uh, zone relay controller. Uh, so, and we're just circulating uh, water through the lines. There's no glycol or anything like that. So it's just uh, water uh, through the lines. And uh, it's a nice uh, clean system and uh, there's nothing better during the winter when you get up early and the floor is not cold. <laughs> so, but the important thing too is that floor, it's concrete, thermal mass, again, the sun, uh, uh, heats it during the winter months, so the living space uh, that we're in, that, that thermal mass absorbs the solar heating and releases it at night, particularly the cold portion, or cold times in winter, uh, late part of December, and of course January as well. 
Uh, and that's the way passive features work uh, with respect to you build in a thermal mass. And I know Craig, uh, many of you have seen his home or you've heard him talk about it. He, he had built that in, into his home in the early days uh, of um, passive home building. So it's a, it's a technique that's been around a long, long time. So um, we have uh, uh, moving uh, along in terms of uh, other aspects is uh, uh, mechanicals, solar and mechanical appliances here on the uh, property. Let me get rid of that. Uh, that. Uh, we put a solar outdoor light in out at the head of the driveway. That's all battery powered uh, LED. Uh, it's a motion sensor. And it's um, a time, it it's really has a timer on it, so it comes on just for at dusk and runs for about six hours, and goes off, and then it'll turn on before dawn. So uh, we can manage any light pollution because we are in basically a, a semi-rural area. So uh, thing, these types of things are inexpensive to uh, install uh, in, on a property. So and uh, over the years, we've been involved with large projects of deploying solar outdoor lighting uh, on parking lots, uh, for example, and in uh, uh, shelters. Uh, so uh, very useful um, uh, application of solar. Another thing we have is uh, we have a solar powered uh, water fountain here, uh, bird bath that is, it's a little panel uh, the pump uh, runs a little DC pump that's in here. So these are little things that can be done, um, you know, with respect to uh, devices in your home. Uh, instead of running wire uh, out to uh, the, uh, these types of uh, devices, uh, so easy to do. Then I wanted to introduce you to our, our solar bees here. Uh, uh, well, we have you hear a lot of pollinators and solar going together. Well, our neighbor's actually a beekeeper, and uh, we plant a bunch of wildflowers, which got a bunch of weeds in it too. But he's raising bees here on our uh, property, and he was curious about the pollinator efforts in Missouri. Um, there's uh, last year was an effort to um, uh, pass a bill. A pollinators bill with uh, solar farms, large solar farms, um, and in some parts of the Midwest that's done in Minnesota as well, where beekeepers are deploying um, or putting uh, their beehives on these large uh, solar farms. Uh, so, and there's incentives that are offered for that. So, just kind of the fun stuff. Uh, Appliances uh, that we put in, um, combination washer dryer uh, with a heat pump, that's all, a, a, all one type of unit. Um, our mechanicals, um, the uh, HRV system, uh, HRV systems, uh, this move takes uh, air from the outside, moves it through the house and exhaust uh, air as well, does some dehumidification. Uh, so with tight homes, you uh, have to look uh, at installing an HRV system. Sometimes you hear this term as an ERV, energy uh, recovery ventilation system as well. So um, this is the only proverbial ductwork that was put in the, the home. Um, so uh, bring in fresh air from the outside and then collect uh, an exhaust uh, air as well. So that's part of the home. Um, not to mention, we also have a tankless hot water heater. Uh, I mean, these are just wonderful uh, mechanical appliances to install. And this is a propane um, unit as, as well. So again, um, instead of uh, electric hot water heaters tend to take up way too much um, electric load. Uh, uh, if you're uh, looking at uh, parsing things back, uh, particularly instead of heating a, a full tank of um, hot uh, water, tankless hot water heaters are one way to go. But there's a however to this, which I'm gonna touch on uh, here in a moment uh, with solar and hot water tanks. And finally, uh, 
uh, tools uh, such as battery powered uh, uh, lawn mowers, lawn tools, they all charge with solar in our case. Uh, uh, we have a client that we um, helped with a home in Mission Hills, and Mission Hills, as you may know, um, high end homes, but they've got strict rules for solar. Well, we put a uh, together a system uh, using roof tiles uh, for the homeowner. And um, he, he in turn was not only happy with the performance of that system and it was not an optimum orientation of a home uh, and the, the home was not new, it was a gut rehab, but um, they've not really had much of an electric bill in the, over the last two years, but he has an electric vehicle now and he's soon going to put in uh, battery storage using Tesla power walls. Uh, so uh, some very key things that uh, you can uh, take into account uh, with respect to when you're planning for solar. So, uh, and next up, uh, we're going to move in terms of, uh, you know, applying the concept to your home, uh, just to summarize, is really to understand your energy usage first, as we talked about earlier, correct easy problems, like uh, seal and insulate. And as Shauna mentioned, having an energy audit done is a good first step. It's, it's money well spent. And uh, an auditor is gonna present you with numbers, so, uh, and how to consider your options and the benefits of each. So review the numbers, and numbers drive behavior. Uh, I'm an, an engineer by training, uh, and um, back in the day when I went to college, we were, uh, uh, the philosophy we were taught under is engineers were supposed to save mankind from itself. So um, in turn, uh, sometimes I wonder, but uh, a lot of numbers uh, are key in making decisions. And uh, as a consumer, uh, you should insist on somebody providing you numbers versus opinions uh, on things. Because often I have uh, rather spirited discussions um, working with uh, contractors, general contractors in particular, um, that uh, say, oh, you can do something like this or you can do something like that. And I say, well, do you have any numbers? And he said, well, I don't need numbers. I just have experience. Well, you know, okay, where are your numbers? Where, because uh, numbers are going to relieve you of any reliability on uh, issues. So, so numbers are important, but keep things, uh, keep it simple and enjoy uh, in terms of uh, this little graphic, I'm attempting to show in, in the world of um, solar, you have an inverter, which is a key uh, component of any uh, solar PV system. Solar modules are commodities. Uh, the inverters are intelligent devices, and these are becoming uh, smart, uh, smarter and smarter uh, with respect to what they're uh, going to be able to do for you and interact with appliances. And um, I made mention earlier, um, the, uh, in, in some parts of the world, people that use solar, uh, when they talk about solar hot water, um, they're actually not putting a solar hot water heating system in in the traditional sense, which was done in the early days, but they're actually using, uh, putting in a solar PV array and uh, they're using the output from the solar, which can be controlled by an inverter uh, in some cases to um, actually run a heating element in a uh, solar hot water heater. It's, think of it as a dump load. If you think of my bell curve earlier, where I'm producing a bunch of solar, um, you can, uh, uh, in effect, uh, instead of sending that to the grid, send that to a uh, hot water, electric hot water tank and heat that. Uh, with um, uh, the, the solar energy and uh, products are come on the market and will con continue to come on the market to do that in a smart fashion, all controlled by an inverter. So moving uh, right along in terms of lessons that we've learned from our experience, um, as far as windows, uh, uh, we have too much glazing, uh, so we have uh, a bit too much passive uh, solar heating to deal with. And it gets a, a little bit warmer than we anticipated on some of the bright sunny days in our home. So, but we're going to mitigate that um, with either a pergola or installing. What we found uh, 
we found a product um, uh, made in uh, Colorado uh, called uh, Solar Lux. Uh, I got that right. My wife, uh, she's in charge of that. Um, they're actually uh, um, awnings, but they run with solar in terms of they, they will adjust um, to the sun. They're pretty cool. Uh, so uh, if you need to put uh, an awning on or two, you should look into, into that. Just Google it. Um, we have high-end windows uh, in the home. Um, the windows are expensive, uh, and these windows are overkill for our climate. Uh, they're made up in Canada. They're great windows, high-quality product. But um, we could, uh, based on what we've learned and everything, uh, we could have um, uh, used more of a standard window in our market down here uh, from companies like uh, Anderson, for example. Uh, so. Um, the sizing of the mini splits, um, the, uh, they're not sized in the home uh, for zoning. And uh, zoning by it means we'd like to turn one off and just pool an area. Well, the installer uh, that was involved was not very experienced with uh, mini splits. Uh, and um, he did what he uh, uh, was based on his experience in installing as he had and they did not have specific experience uh, with this product line at all. And uh, we've, um, we had someone from the factory uh, come down uh, here to help. But in our home, we have to run all three of the units in order to cool it. Uh, so in each of the rooms, and that was not our intent to begin with, even though we were assured of this. Uh, the mistake we made, uh, we should have insisted more on his numbers and everything as opposed to his opinion. So that's why we say numbers are important. Uh, running an HRV system. Some people will tell you uh, that you got to run it 24-7. Well, our experience is, no, you don't. Uh, we run the HRV system uh, uh, certainly uh, when... Uh, we uh, are um, using showers to remove humidity from uh, 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 bathrooms uh, or uh, when we've been cooking, but uh, we did not put an uh, oven exhaust fan in because uh, our contractor assured us that the uh, HRV would exhaust uh, whatever the stove uh, uh, would, or wh whatever we were cooking, cooking odors. Well, that's not true. Uh, and I, a, a colleague of mine um, who's an energy uh, consultant, I've talked with him at length about this, and he, he agrees with uh, you know, what our experience is um, uh, uh, proven in terms of he's a numbers guy. So the point being, uh, show me the numbers as a consumer, again, whether you're building new or uh, improving your home get the numbers. Uh, so opinions, everyone's got one, but uh, numbers will allow you to make an informed uh, decision about uh, 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 where you're gonna spend your money and the, um, the benefits that you're after. So those are some key lessons uh, that we learned and happy to talk to anybody offline about particulars. Uh, so um, solar market update, okay. It's, Smart energy management is uh, the thing that uh, uh, various manufacturers, particularly inverter manufacturers, are talking about uh, today and delivering products to enable that. Uh, we touched upon that earlier. And um, this happens to be from one manufacturer, but if I would pull, if I, if you went to Tesla's website, you'd see something similar uh, as well. But in this case, um, that inverter, as I mentioned previously, is uh, intended to be an intelligent device and will do energy management and communicate with other devices um, in, in the home or the building, uh, whether to, um, uh, uh, to maybe not uh, direct power to that load, particularly if um, you're in a situation uh, like in Kansas uh, where um, rates, how you're charged if you're a solar customer for demand charges. Uh, these inverters can be smart enough and programmed uh, to uh, mitigate that, particularly when you have battery storage involved. 
and then uh, dealing with uh, electric vehicle charging as well, um, that can all be managed uh, through an inverter. And your view is this monitoring platform here for your smart device that I showed you in real time in the case of our home. And in, in the case of solar modules, I mentioned that they're basically a commodity. Well, solar modules uh, uh, are being um, deployed with uh, module level electronics for a few reasons. One is safety uh, reasons. Number two is optimizing their behavior. And this happens to be something called an optimizer, or it could be a micro inverter, for example. A lot of good choices out there in the market um, to, to make with respect to these, uh, deploying these devices. So, and one of the benefits, you know, down the road, um, in, in case of, uh, if you have a, a damaged solar module, for example, and you can't quite get uh, that module, uh, you can get a similar module. And the fact that you have a, a module level electronics, you can just plug and play, remove that module and put that in, even though it's not the same um, type of module that was initially deployed. Um, with um, traditional or string inverters, you really can't do that uh, you, uh, because of uh, electrical characteristics and so forth. So, and with uh, module level electronics, you get more energy production in, uh, in the end, somewhere between eight and 12%, uh, depending upon your particular situation. So the future, uh, and if you're um, looking at uh, systems or considering something down the road, smart energy management will be a common theme uh, that not only integrates all the solar together and how it works, the EV charging, but also uh, the appliances in your device. But from an everything solar perspective, don't make it overly complicated. Uh, keep it um, simple, uh, uh, as we talked about earlier. So. Um, Briefly, I'd like to t um, touch upon solar policy updates uh, that impact uh, the solar markets here locally and even on a federal level. Um, in Missouri, uh, there, uh, through our industry association called MOSIA, and MOSIA um, is comprised of member companies not at, uh, that, uh, and speaks for the solar industry at the state level uh, through the legislature. Um, in turn, uh, we founded the organization. It's, this is a 10th year, if uh, memory serves me right. Uh, but the, um, the, the voice there is uh, to represent uh, not only the uh, installers, uh, distributors, manufacturers that do business in the state, but also in the case of uh, consumers and to uh, advocate for policies that are friendly to solar. Well, we had a whole laundry list of uh, things to do this year, but a little event called the pandemic kind of uh, uh, put that um, on the uh, back burner this year. But our uh, industry association um, has uh, been focused uh, in terms of identifying issues um, with uh, utilities, particularly co-ops that maybe um, slowing down the process for approvals or putting hurdles in the way of solar development. Um, these uh, hurdles um, are uh, something that the industry association uh, can take steps on and escalate these or bring these up to uh, govern bo govern governing bodies like in the legislature or the Public Service Commission because we have built relationships with uh, legislators over the years uh, and uh, some people who have moved from the legislature to the Public Service Commission in uh, Missouri, particularly uh, uh, Jason Holzman, who was a state senator, he's now a commissioner, uh, but he understands solar and he's a friendly voice for us. But uh, again, our industry association is attempting to deal with uh, roadblocks and uh, that may be coming up and even issues with uh, some uh, jurisdictions uh, with um, uh, issues surrounding permitting because uh, there is an effort to drive down the uh, cost of solar, particularly soft costs, and that's related to uh, the engineering permitting uh, side of things as well as the sales side of things because um, that's um, a huge element of cost in things, makes solar more affordable. 
in Kansas, uh, the some of you may be aware that uh, Kansas, uh, the Supreme Court in Kansas earlier this spring, uh, ruled against uh, ACC uh, and Westar, uh, now known as Evergy, with respect to these demand charges that were added to uh, solar bills or solar customers. Uh, it was ruled um, uh, because they were discriminating against a class of people and was unconstitutional based on the Kansas comp, uh, Constitution. That's my understanding how it played out. You have to really talk to someone that's more in the know on the uh, legal aspects of it. But there's uh, been a request um, in, uh, in terms of, um, or I should say KCC has uh, reopened the Westar Red case to incorporate a large rate designation quest into all regulated utilities. And uh, interveners uh, through our industry uh, association in Kansas, which is the Clean Energy Business Network, which is a, a, a subcommittee of sorts of the Climate and Energy Project that uh, Dorothy Barnett and team uh, has been leading the charge on. So they're our voice in Kansas, as well as the consumer's voice in Kansas. And uh, this team of people um, has been doing a fabulous job given the resources uh, that uh, we've been able to provide them, which hasn't been a lot because it does take money. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, we do have a voice and we do have the ear of some people in Kansas and, and changes are uh, starting to come rather slowly, but um, uh, I'm pretty optimistic about what eventually um, will transpire in Kansas in improving things for energy efficiency and the solar industry. And because Kansas, as we all know, has a tremendous solar resource, uh, much like wind. Finally, on the federal level, um, those of you who may be familiar with uh, FERC, uh, Federal Energy, energy Regulatory Commission, uh, a group called the um, uh, New England Ratepayers Association, I believe it's uh, the uh, organization. Nobody knows who's funding them, but yeah, it's the New England Ratepayers Association. Uh, filed a petition to transfer the uh, uh, net metering statutes and con uh, control from the state level to the federal level, um, which uh, would, in essence, uh, they're, they're uh, agenda is today uh, in net metering uh, in our states, Kansas and Missouri, when you export power, you get retail value for that power. Uh, in turn, um, if uh, this uh, effort would be successful, you'd only get uh, a wholesale value, which is typically about a third of retail value for that energy that you would export uh, to the um, uh, grid. Uh, historically, um, net metering is a state issue driven by state policies through a renewable portfolio standard or renewable energy standard. And each state has its um, own set of rules and does things differently. However, something uh, done at the federal level uh, would uh, put a, a severe uh, impact on uh, consumers' rights. So um, it's speculated, uh, again, the money that's uh, behind uh, the New England Ratepayers Association efforts is coming from um, dark sources, so to put it. Anyways, uh, Green America is one organization. You can go to their website and sign on the petition. Through our industry associations here in Kansas and Missouri, uh, we've been uh, voicing our uh, uh, opposition to that, uh, working with uh, also politicians at the federal level and, and uh, Congress um, that are uh, that our industry associations develop relationships with uh, to try and deal with this, as well as testifying um, in front of uh, FERC's uh, hearing. So, so there are efforts underway uh, again to deal with those uh, those issues. So. So that's a quickie on policy update. Uh, and again, I encourage all of you to go to greenamerica.org and uh, voice your opinions uh, and understand what the issue is uh, and uh, uh, object to that. So um, in summary, or the takeaways from today, uh, 
uh, like to uh, point out that uh, uh, solar and storage are one and the same. And uh, don't become overwhelmed with smart stuff uh, with respect to all these smart devices uh, because it may not be smart. It may not be too smart to do that or smart enough to uh, really uh, do what you want it to do because we all do get a little frustrated with technology from time to time. Uh, understanding the numbers is key and self-consumption is what it's all about uh, as it relates to solar uh, and your, your solar, um, using your solar energy. Um, and uh, again, the trend uh, with solar and storage, one and the same. And that inverter is going to be uh, your most, uh, the decision you make about any system uh, that inverter that you purchase is going to be uh, the most critical element of the solar PV system. Uh, and in closing, uh, I want to um, point out too, um, when you deal with solar companies, uh, ensure that they're uh, reputable folks um, with respect to that they're uh, part of the, the industry associations in the, in the states because they, uh, we've all been vetted and we signed on to um, uh, a code of ethics um, uh, with respect to the, how we have to represent ourselves, both at the state level and even our national organization. And they take it pretty serious uh, when there are violations or complaints against companies. Uh, there are some um, efforts in Missouri uh, in particular to um, look at uh, providing more of a formal platform to deal with consumer complaints because as solar has propagated itself, there have been more consumer complaints uh, and they come to Mosia's attention or a legislator gets wind of it and Mosia gets a call and they're typically from um, non-member companies, of course, uh, and in turn, some of the issues uh, have to deal with making uh, unsubstantiated claims. Uh, some talk about a warranty, a 25-year warranty, and um, I, I like to point out that, yeah, there's a 25-year warranty on solar module uh, power production, but that's not a, a warranty that the uh, solar company's uh, giving you. It's the manufacturer. That solar company may or may not be around uh, in 25 years. Uh, so, um, so you need to understand those warranties, uh, not the misrepresentation that's being communicated uh, in some of the uh, advertising, but we are making efforts to um, uh, deal with that uh, in the future. So, uh, and in closing, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share our experiences with you, and I hope you've gotten some benefits from it. Uh, and I'd like to, of course, to thank Shauna for um, not only her friendship over the years, but uh, her expertise. Uh, but one poor uh, person in particular, I'd like to uh, offer a personal shout out to is Craig. Many of you know that Craig is uh, leaving and going to be residing in Colorado, uh, moving closer to his family. Uh, when I first came to town 15 plus years ago, Craig was one of the first guys I met. Uh, he's offered a lot of advice over the years. A lot of value advice, uh, very knowledgeable, but I often, when I, was, when I first met Craig, I was impressed by his passion and his principles. And to this day, I, have, I hold him in high regard, and I just want to say thank you, Craig, for everything you've done. Kansas's loss is Colorado's gain, and wish you much success in your future endeavors. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Craig. And well, we thank you, Bob, for those kind words. Um, uh, I appreciate it, and we're going to go now into a question and answer period, and I'm just going to go right down the list as the questions came in. Sure. Um, so I'm. Let's see. I think I'll. Do you do you think you'll have anything more to show? Can we uh, get rid of? You can take sharing over. Sharing option. Yeah. Yep. You can do. Uh, it. I'll stop my share. Are Are we done sharing? Yeah. There we go. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. So one question is, um, let's see. I'm from Tim Kemper. I'm curious what went into Bob's decision to use battery storage as opposed to direct metering. And are there issues that might prohibit them from both being used in conjunction? 
Okay. Well, uh, our plan is to live off grid. Uh, so, um, for obvious uh, many that, reasons, uh, one is I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. You. Can you hear me, Craig? Can you hear me, Craig? Craig. Bob's I, can, I can hear you, low. Bob. I don't know what that means. I can hear you, Bob. Craig, can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? I see. Donna I'm was hearing uh, Bob. talking. Here, hang on a second, Craig. Here, now I hear you. Okay, I just uh, muted and unmuted myself then. So, okay. how's that? That's great. Okay. Well, on reference to the question, our um, objective is uh, to live off grid. Uh, so, uh, in terms of um, even. Uh, with using batteries when you're still tied to the grid. Uh, we're, as I mentioned, trying to sort out some uh, problems with uh, being able to heat our, uh, our barn area, which is our business, uh, during the winter months and getting the battery uh, size uh, right. There's recently been some additional products that have been announced uh, that I'm um, planning on putting in, which will uh, uh, allow us to uh, ultimately get to where we want to get so I can add more batteries and then control the whole uh, situation. Uh, so so uh, that's um, it's sort of, uh, that's basically the, the uh, rationale behind things right now because this has been uh, a work in process or progress or process uh, as we've gone through it and things we've learned about. So. So I hope okay. that answers your question. And then I, I plugged in a question. Is there, I know that there are things that we call energy audits and they evaluate the heat loss and heat gain. Are there, is there beginning to be a service out there that is called an electrical audit where they analyze your little devices and your big devices that consume electricity in your home? Well, there's there's not, not a service other than um, that I'm aware of, uh, but uh, I've recommended or referred people to using uh, like that sense device that we talked about, and um, through sense, um, their website and their monitor, they have a. Um, their uh, blogs and they have a tremendous amount of uh, information and learnings that people are sharing and it, it, it's actually quite amazing uh, as to the thought process and what people have come up with based on a better understanding of uh, their usage. Even our solar customers uh, have put in uh, sense as well and, that, and some have said this is exactly what I want. Uh, in our solar monitoring system that I showed you. I can't drill down to the appliance or the load level yet, but um, I can with sense. That's why one of the reasons I have it in, in there. So I know what each of these loads is doing. That's how we're um, trying to better understand our heat pump uh, issues so we can size the batteries right. Okay. Okay. What have, uh, what have, this is again for me, what have you, encountered or discovered in terms of window insulation systems. Back in the 80s when I was building some 60 passive solar super insulated homes, um, we used window quilts a lot from appropriate technology and I think they went out of business way back when when we didn't care about energy for a couple of decades. Um, and we used window quilts and they were a really neat system. What do you know of in the window insulation system it's offered out there. I don't know much, and uh, I would defer that to uh, someone that's uh, more in that business. Okay. If anyone out there uh, has information along those lines, raise your hand in the lower right hand corner, and then I'll. Oh, Craig, Craig. Yeah, uh, Craig. I think that I think the window designs are, you know, the the glaze the glazing is got different technologies on it to reflect heat back into the space, and so the the windows are getting better. So not to say that we wouldn't need 
a window quilt at some point or on some windows or something, but I think the glazing or the, the energy things that they're building into the new windows today have coatings on them that reflect heat back in and they reflect heat out in the summertime and in in the wintertime. And so that's the way I understand some of the windows going. Okay. So maybe we don't need heat, don't need window quilts as much. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and then Bob, from an air quality standpoint, how do you evaluate on, when you were talking about your ERV, how do you evaluate uh, the quality of your air, irregardless of odors, to say, well, I don't need to use my ERV now. I can kind of, I can turn it off. It, it's just by comfort level. Um, in, in terms of if we don't run the uh, HRV uh, for a really extended amount of time, uh, it, uh, you can uh, sense the um, air getting stale. Yeah. Uh, so probably humidity level. That, that's humidity. for the personal comfort. Yeah. Well, like, with the humidity. You want, uh, yeah, you don't want that yeah, too the, high. No, the mini splits uh, t take care of the humidity um, as well. So. And then Shauna says, "Do you use mini splits in the winter to heat in the house, or not needed?" We don't heat with the mini splits in the house. Uh, we use the radiant floor or the passive uh, solar uh, heating um, for, from the solar gain, and uh, occasionally the fireplace. So, yeah. yeah. So, so my thing is about the ERV. If you're not using the mini splits in the winter time, that's when you're going to have the humidity build up in your house, and that's when you don't want it. So that's a good reason to run your ERV in the winter. Maybe not 24/7, but I run mine like for 20 minutes out of every hour. My mine has a control that I can set to run, and I think that's an like an optimum sort of. So it's constantly taking extra excess humidity from showering and and cooking and things out of the air in the winter time. Because yeah, that's a, if you're not using the mini splits, you would be doing that with if not using the mini splits. So. Yeah, we run it uh, we, we, uh, through the controller. We had it to run at 20 minute intervals when we run it for um, periods of time. Uh, so uh, and it, and it depends if uh, wash is being done. Uh, uh, my wife, Nikki's running a uh, washer. Um, we run uh, the uh, mini split uh, or the HRV uh, then as well because of uh, the extra humidity. Of course, I mentioned the showers, but when we do run it, it um, it's very program come on for 20 minute uh, increments. Uh, so, uh, but not, not the 24 seven. Yeah. Shauna then also asked, uh, do you make a concerted effort to reduce your energy usage in the evening and night? Uh, is that for, for me, yes. Greg? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, we, uh, to begin with, we've never been uh, a big user of uh, energy uh, uh, really at all um, during the, uh, even when we were uh, living in uh, suburbia. Um, but uh, in the evenings, um, our loads are really just comprised of uh, lighting and entertainment equipment. And um, just uh, when the HRV comes on, but this time of year we're running the mini splits uh, for air conditioning purposes in a, in a fan. But those loads, as I showed you uh, earlier, where our loads were about a half of uh, KW, um, we've got um, the, uh, we at that point, we're running uh, 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 the two mini splits, the, the compressors, and um, one fan and computer equipment. So that, that's pretty much the uh, trend. Uh, of course, we've got LED lighting. LEDs are everywhere. Uh, so um, so we're, we've just been prudent to begin with uh, in terms of that uh, lifestyle. Okay. And uh, John Luter asks, how many, he's got several questions here, I'll do them one at a time. 
how many cycles will your batteries last? How many years will the batteries last? Uh, the batteries, uh, memory serves me right, these batteries will uh, uh, have a lifespan of uh, uh, 20 years. And um, if I remember right, because li these are lithium batteries and a lithium you can uh, run, um, uh, you can, the death of discharge, you can take them down to a, a hundred percent. Uh, so, uh, and uh, if memory serves me right, I think you can cycle them 8,000 times. At, uh, I don't remember on the cut sheet. Okay. Uh, John also asked, how many watts per panel, I assume, on your system? And do you recommend these new panels that are 500 watts per panel? Uh, ours are uh, 60 cell 305 watt panels, and that just was driven by available space that we had on the uh, barn roof. Uh, the 500 watt panels, uh, the trend is higher wattage panels in the 72 or even 96 cell uh, arrangements. So you're seeing more watts per square or per area being delivered by the manufacturers. So more and more uh, solar installers, if given the option, will go with uh, the uh, higher wattage uh, cells. Uh, so, uh, so if that's the trend. Yeah. Uh, and then Keith asks, what went into your decision to orient your home to 165 degrees? Well, it basically had to do with the topography uh, in terms of what we had to work with and the location of the home because of the setbacks uh, for the property line here in Platte County have to be 100 feet from a, a minimum 100 feet from a, a north-south property line. So uh, given where we could set the home and the view that we were after and um, being able to um, get what we wanted, uh, that's, that's what it settled on. Okay. Um, and then uh, Ken Reed uh, asked, and I've, I've asked to unmute Ken. So uh, Ken, if you could unmute yourself, because I don't understand your question. Carbon monoxide levels, one, carbon dioxide monitor controller. So what, what is your question there, Ken? Um, all right, can you hear me? Yep. The question came up earlier about the there's several ways when you put in an HRV or ERV that you can determine the optimum ventilation rate or cycle times. Um, first of all, if the person doing the audit or if you have a what's called a home energy rating or HERS rating, then for sure you're gonna get a um, average ventilation rate that the home has now and a, uh, and a optimum ventilation, ventilation rate the home should have after all the improvements are done. And most of the time, if you do a lot of improvements and really tighten the home up and make it energy efficient with the insulation and all, it's going to become a little bit too tight to rely on cracks and, and things like that to provide enough air. So that's when you start getting into the need for the mechanical ventilation. And then when you get into that, what you're going to find is that the ventilation rates for most standard ones run from about 50, 60 CFM or cubic feet a minute to maybe 110 or 120 until you go to the bigger units then you can go higher. But most homes need between 80 and 100 in that range. Um, what, what happens is you can do the calculations based on your optimum ventilation rate and that tells you cycle times if you need X amount of air per hour or, and then that's why I put the other information in there. You can have a carbon monoxide device if you have a naturally aspirated appliance, which means like a furnace or a water heater that you can see the flame, but they're not sealed combustion. You can have something as an override to kick it on high if, they have, if that level gets higher, or the more optimum way to do it is if you put in a carbon dioxide monitor, that can turn the, the uh, ERV or HRV on high or low or off, depending on how sophisticated you get to keep the dioxide levels at a certain amount, which is normally how you measure the air quality inside a home. And there's other ways too, like monitoring for particulates or volatile organic compounds or all this other stuff. But getting into that is fairly sophisticated equipment, but monitoring the carbon dioxide levels is relatively easy. 
And then there's also devices that go in the bathroom because when you put in a in a mechanical device, the best way to install it that works the best as far as keeping your house, the whole two things, you want to be healthier into your environment with filtration and all that, and you want to minimize the amount of moisture buildup inside the home. And by doing that, you try to draw the air that goes back outside from moisture producing areas, whether that's the bathroom, your kitchen, if you have to have a hot tub or something like that, that area, you want to grab that and exit it as fast as possible. And you can put in what they call humidistats that'll also kick the unit on high if humidity levels reach a certain threshold that you can preset. So there are ways to control it or, or to determine what the optimum is and also ways to have it kick in if there's something that goes over optimum. Any any comment on all that, Bob? No, oh, John, uh, yeah, I, I follow what Ken's saying and um, we have carbon dioxide uh, detectors uh, in, in place um, uh, in couple locations in the home. Um, so, uh, but um, again, in our situation, because uh, we tried to, uh, we, we ran the thing for 24 seven when we first, uh, almost the first year we were here and that's, that's appeared that's clear to be overkill and throttling back like we've done. And uh, plus uh, we like to open the windows in uh, you know, times of the year and, uh, you get get nice airflow. Uh, it's worked out um, uh, quite well for us. But I, I could uh, add there's a, a simple I've done thing it. that, but we do it too. People don't have access to all this stuff. Or they want to put in the ventilation machine or whatever they want to do, HRV or ERV, and they say, you know, this is a real sophisticated. You talk about sophisticated stuff. What do I need to know? That's just like a rule of thumb. Rule of thumb is this: cook something stinky, make fish. Make something that really stinks the house up. Make use something with a whole lot of garlic. If the smell doesn't go away from the evening by the next morning, you don't have enough ventilation. Right. Crank it up. Yeah. A little. Yeah. Uh, Dave. Yeah. Dave, Dave Fullerton asks, uh, "Do you did you consider a geothermal HVAC?" No. No. It would have been overkill. Yeah, it would have been overkill. Yeah, us. when I was building, that was my, even though I did put in one or two, but that was my, uh, that was my opinion was that geothermal, I'd much rather put take the, the thousands of dollars I put into a geothermal system and put them into the shell of the house or some other way of saving energy and making sure that the home was well designed. But uh, I know that they are a, uh, a very efficient tool, but when you're building from scratch, there are, I think, better ways to spend your money, and that's just my opinion. Um, yep. Uh, Ken Reed yep. uh, says the home energy audit or HERS rating determines an optimum air change rate. Okay, I think you've already talked about that. Uh, and then John Hen says, and this is our last question, so if you got a question, better write it down quick. Do you have information? Chat it in. Huh? Chat it in. Tell them to chat and yeah, write, right. ask their question. Chat it in. Do you have information on solar window glazing? Has the efficiency changed of solar panels? How has the efficiency changed of solar panels? So the two, actually two questions there. Do you have information no, on I don't, window glazing? Yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, much about windows. I'm not a window person, um, but um, solar module efficiency continues to improve uh, generally, uh, and it's been uh, doing part two improvements in uh, the existing um, uh, cell technology and how things are done uh, in the cells. Um, and, and we're seeing efficiencies in the neighborhood of uh, uh, anywhere from 19 to 20, 21 percent with this, uh, what I would call a standard uh, type of uh, solar module. And some call uh, in the cell structure for, uh, related to what they call PERC architecture, PERC. It's basically an architecture that they've uh, put in the cell where the electrons are released from sunlight and they're harvested uh, by the uh, um, the wiring bus uh, that's run through the um, cells or run through each of the, the panels. So uh, that and the fact that when you look at a module today, 
they look like half cells, which they are. Um, they're, they're, they're improving the density of those cells and resulting in better efficiencies, harvesting more sunlight. The premium products um, uh, that are on the market and, in terms of uh, products uh, from companies like LG Sun, and SunPower, for example, um, they have um, other techniques that they used uh, in improving the efficiency uh, of their uh, modules and, uh, and some material science uh, questions. So, uh, so the uh, the glass uh, that uh, goes on the uh, uh, modules themselves, the glazing. They, there's been improvements in uh, those uh, particular glazings that are made for solar modules. Uh, so. Uh, so, so, and the, the other uh, trend that's happening too uh, is these uh, uh, bifacial panels. Uh, you're starting to see more coming on the market that uh, take a light that's reflected from uh, a ground surface. Uh, so, okay. So, and, I hope uh, that answers your question. Yep. Uh, George Hake asked, do you know any, did, it, did you do anything about radon remediation? Yeah, we have a system uh, in the home that uh, vents radon. We had to have that in. Uh, what are, uh, Keith asks, what, oh, well, let me uh, back up. Uh, Ken, Ken says, the Energy Star website has the proper glazing for various regions. So go to the Energy Star website for uh, proper glazing information. And then Keith asks, what are your future plans for your property? Do you have other big projects in your plans? Well, <laughs> yeah, our, our, well, uh, we're not going to be adding any more structures to the property or anything. Uh, uh, but uh, what we're planning on um, doing, uh, of course, and ultimately um, uh, correcting some of the issues we have, uh, but um, uh, living off grid, but uh, planning on transitioning to electric vehicles. Uh, I've got to keep up with Al Pugsley when I talked to him last week. He's always <laughs> keeping up with Al Pugsley, for those of you that may know Al and his passion for EVs. But another thing um, uh, that um, I have been researching in order to uh, tend to the uh, uh, grass that we have here, uh, we've got about six acres to mow, um, I would like to find an electric uh, zero turn uh, motor uh, mower and I have found one of the company out of Ohio because you're starting to see those products in uh, yeah. like, uh, Home Depot uh, and uh, they're really efficient uh, because motors are efficient, uh, electric motors to propel uh, vehicles. Uh, so. I have found one and I'm trying to get some pricing on uh, one that's large enough for our property, but so I can get rid of uh, all the internal combustion engines uh, that uh, I really don't have a need for because um, a couple things that uh, come to mind in terms of the, there's um, information, consumer information about um, uh, how cutting your lawn uh, with a lawnmower, gas lawnmower, contributes to pollution and uh, these electric mowers uh, that this Eco brand uh, that like Home Depot Lowell's I think everybody carries it those are really great mowers and uh, you know you're looking at power tools uh, they have a nice line of uh, battery powered power tools um, as does Roby and some others uh, so a lot of cool stuff uh, there and uh, so I encourage people as you look at replacing things to look in that direction. Uh, Ken Reed, why don't you go ahead and uh, you have a comment about uh, glass and glazing. Um, why don't you, why don't you just ask your question or make your statement? Oh, I think I got Nick. You may have muted yourself, Ken. Uh, oh, there you go. Hey, there we go. Um, not trying to talk that much, but I'm just. 
the, the glazing that they put on solar panels for the longest time has just always been low E, or I mean, not low E, excuse me. Low E is the Mississippi, low iron tempered glass. And, but it has to be a certain thickness. And Mike's saying they're coming, or Mike, Mike, Bob, huh, let me start over. Bob is saying that there's new technologies in glass, but a lot of the solar panels now have a, just a clear glazing that isn't separate from the panel. And it's just, it's a little complicated to explain, but what's really going to change everything is nanotechnologies. And that's what I was trying to get at in just a short description is that the, the couple, couple things, nanotechnologies and glass that is micro broken because when you hit glass and it's one solid sheet, it cracks and breaks easily, even if it's uh, tempered, it'll break into little pellets. But this new way they're making glass with these little bitty, like imperfections in it really, little bitty, bitty bubbles. When something hits it, it just makes a spot because the glass already has room to expand. Just like when you put the expansion joints in a road or in a sidewalk, if you put expansion joints theoretically in glass, it's much stronger. You can hit it over and over with different uh, hail or whatever and the glass will have these little smash spots but they won't break all over and so um, obviously if that happens you're going to have to have it replaced but that's going to be the next wave too is glass that doesn't bust in a thousand pieces but can take a direct punch and will absorb it. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I think, yeah, the point about nanotechnology is key. Yeah, that's the research and materials and everything. That'll be coming very soon. That's all I got. All right, uh, George Haig asks, uh, and this is the last question I've got, are you aware that Tesla will allow their car batteries to backfeed to power your home? Oh, yeah. Yep, yep, we've known about that for a while. Okay, well, folks, I would appreciate um, any, anybody who has suggestions or comments about this new format it's really one that we should have been doing all along, but we just got into over the years, a meeting mode. Well, this is another meeting, not to mention that it saves carbon because there's not a bunch of cars going to one place, not to mention that the meeting is automatically recorded uh, and we can upload it. But I would appreciate any comments you have about or suggestions about this meeting this meeting format and send them to info at heartlandrenewable.org. Info at heartlandrenewable.org. Um, and uh, we'd like to thank you. And, and just an FYI, I don't know what I'm going to be doing in Colorado, um, but chances are I'll still be involved with uh, the uh, Missouri and Kansas chapter for the uh, uh, of what hres is and so i imagine they'll let me still play if i want to from colorado even though i'm a, a buffalo now as opposed to a jayhawk um, of course we'll let you come play <laughs> yeah yes. uh, yeah <laughs> so uh bob do you have any final comments before we enter tonight or this afternoon. No, but yep. Thanks for everybody's time and best of luck to, uh, to you, Craig. And uh, we'll see everybody down the road. Yeah. Thank I, you I, very I, much, Bob. I think, I think this worked great. So yeah. you did a great job. Okay. Thanks. Glad we could do it. Thanks for allowing us to participate. All right. Today, I'll, I'll get this on the interweb uh, real soon. <laughs>